Um, welcome to the second part of the afternoon session. And we're going to start with Adam Wills, who's going to tell us about trade off constructions for quantum locally testable codes. Sound okay? Good. Not too loud, not too quiet. Um, thank you very much for coming. Is that too loud? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you to the organizers and thank you very much to my collaborators, uh, David Lin and Min Shu uh, So we're gonna talk about quantum locally testable codes and that's kind of niche. So I'll start by saying in, um, uh, in quite a lot of detail what those are and then why we care about them. Um, I'll then go on to say what's been done in terms of building them. Um, and then I'll say what our contribution is. So we provide these constructions that can turn one quantum locally testable code into another. And in some circumstances, you can get uh, new parameters that were previously unknown um, to exist. Um, at the end, I'll have just enough time to kind of whiz through the three constructions and say uh, what they are and how we do them. So first of all, what are quantum locally testable codes? Well, they're kind of in the same ballpark as QLDPC codes. And I think that will be relatively familiar in this room. So the idea is, is that um, for fault tolerance reasons, you want to have every stabilizer containing only a small number of qubits and every qubit getting acted on by a small number of stabilizers. We're introduced, we're interested in this idea, um, but not for the reasons of fault tolerance, but for uh, local testability. Informally, a quantum locally testable code are QLDPC codes with this extra property called local testability. And local testability informally uh, means that you can detect uh, errors by only acting locally, so by only acting on a few qubits. So a bit more formally, there is this randomized testing procedure, which I'll go on to describe. And um, it only acts on a few qubits. And uh, if a large error has happened, then it will detect that large error with large probability. The degree to which a code is locally testable is measured by its soundness and locality. So these are two parameters I'll, I'll introduce, but the soundness is um, a parameter that if it's larger, it gives you a larger chance of succeeding in this test. And the locality, if it's smaller, it means you act more locally. So you're only acting on fewer qubits in this test. So to start with soundness. So soundness is to do with how many um, stabilizers you see being violated by an error. So for a general stabilizer code, if there's an undetectable error, then you'll see some number of stabilizers being violated. But in general, you don't have anything more than that promise to you. For a quantum locally testable code, the syndrome gives you a bit more information. So if a larger error happens, then there is a larger syndrome. So there are more stabilizers being violated. A bit more precisely, uh, soundness is defined this way. So the code has soundness rho if for any Pauli error E, the fraction of the stabilizers that get violated, which is the left-hand side, is at least the soundness times the fraction of the qubits that are afflicted by the error. So that's the weight of the error divided by the number of qubits. So that's fraction of stabilizers that get violated is at least soundness times the fraction of the qubits that are afflicted by the error. Uh, so here's the same equation again. Um, so how are we gonna randomly test for errors? How are we gonna look for errors? Well, the natural testing procedure to do is to pick a random stabilizer and measure it and just see if it's violated. And the probability you'll see it get violated is just this left-hand side. It's the fraction of the stabilizers that are violated. Then what we find indeed is if we have a large soundness row, the probability that we'll see a violated stabilizer, the probability that we pick up that an error has happened is large, assuming the error itself is quite large. In order to get all the way to genuine local testability, it's not just getting large soundness, but we need a small locality as well. So formally, locality is the maximum of the number of qubits involved in each stabilizer or the maximum of the number of stabilizers acting on each qubit. So in particular, if you have a small locality, then every stabilizer only involves a small number of qubits. And so, as I claimed earlier, small locality means that your random testing procedure only acts on a small number of qubits. So why should we care about this? Um, you can imagine a situation in which this is useful in QEC. I mean, it's not impossible to imagine that it's useful to be able to only interact with a few qubits and detect a large error happening with good probability. 
But this is speculative for a number of reasons, um, not least because these QLTC constructions are kind of crazy. So the constants are very, very bad generally. Um, there's also the fact that we don't know how to do fault tolerant computation on them. Um, but yeah, they are much more interesting uh, in the realms of complexity theory, especially Hamiltonian complexity theory. So a lot of people will know about NLTS. In 2015, Eldar and Harrow showed that if you have a QLTC, if you could prove one exists with some really nice parameters, then you'll automatically get the NLTS conjecture. There are also speculated connections between QLTC and the quantum PCP conjecture, which is this super important, super famous conjecture in complexity theory. Um, the, the intuition here is that classical LTCs were indispensable in proving the classical PCP theorem, um, but it's, it's kind of debated whether the same will be true on the quantum side. But as a baby step towards this, something that people are working on is trying to get like an NLTS plus result. The idea being that QLTCs were shown to imply NLTS in 2015, NLTS was then proved with codes that are weaker than QLTCs. So people are looking at maybe QLTCs can imply a stronger result than NLTS. But right now we're interested in just building QLTCs. And the early QLTCs look like this. So there's four figures of merit, and I explained two of them. The local testability ones are soundness and locality. And then there's two more which are very familiar from general error correction dimension and distance. Uh, dimension is the number of encoded logical qubits, and the distance is the minimum number of qubits that you need to afflict with an error in order to create a logical error. So these are the familiar ones. So the early QLTC constructions look like this. Um, they only encoded a very small number of qubits, so uh, only encoding like one or two logical qubits, and they had a square root distance. So that's kind of reminiscent of the surface code in a sense, um, but they're very much different to the surface code because the surface code has quite bad local testability properties. Whereas these have, these have good local testability properties. So the soundness is very good. It's polylog away from being optimal. And the locality is also still good. So it's logarithmically away from being optimal. There were subsequent works then in the following years uh, that explored other areas of this four dimensional parameter space. You can imagine that for a while the situation was quite complicated because if you have four different parameters, you want to optimize all of them. But in the interim, you have a situation where some codes do some things very well and other codes do other things poorly. And there was, you know, there was a, a weird kind of frontier going. Fortunately, now the situation is much more simple. Earlier this year, Dinerlin and Vidic introduced this paper that gave almost optimal QLTCs. And initially they showed this dependent on a certain conjecture being true but they updated their paper, um, not only removing this uh, need for the conjecture, but also actually improving the parameters. And the parameters are as shown. So they get a linear dimension, otherwise known as a constant rate. Um, the soundness and distance are almost optimal, both of them, so they're both polylog away from where they want to be. So soundness wants to be constant, distance wants to be linear, and they're both polylog away from that. And the locality went from a polylog to a constant in the second version. So this brings us quite close to the QLTC conjecture, which is this super interesting, super hard uh, problem in uh, quantum coding theory um, about the existence of an optimal quantum locally testable code. So constant soundness, constant locality, linear distance, linear dimension. And this is a natural follow on from the QLDPC conjecture, which was famously solved in 2021. Um, and that just asks for linear distance, linear dimension, constant locality with no mind paid to the soundness. So our contribution is to give certain code transformation techniques. So we can turn one quantum locally testable code into another with different parameters. And these uh, improve certain parameters at the expense of some others. And so we call them trade-off constructions. We have three of them. There is a weight reduction procedure for QLTCs. So this will, um, uh, push the locality down so it improves the locality at the expense of some other things. There is a soundness amplification procedure, so this improves the soundness at the expense of some other things. And there's a distance amplification procedure, so again, improving the distance at the expense of some other things. And these are the, uh, the, the uh, parameter transformations that take place. So for weight reduction, indeed, the weight reduction can make the locality go all the way down to a constant where we want it, but it's at the expense of literally everything else, the soundness, the distance, and the dimension. 
for the soundness amplification, it indeed can improve soundness. And it's quite nice because it can actually maintain your distance and dimension, but it is at the expense of locality. And then the distance amplification can put the distance all the way up to linear, um, and it can do that while maintaining the dimension, but it makes both the soundness and locality worse. But if you apply these in the right ways, you can get new quantum locally testable codes that were previously not known. So in particular, we want to apply these to the DLD work. So this is their version two that I showed earlier. And suppose you hit this with distance amplification. So you can push the distance all the way up to linear and that maintains the linear dimension, which is nice. But then that comes at the expense of the locality. So the locality rises. If you then further hit this with soundness amplification, then you'll hit the soundness and push it up to constant where it wants to be, maintaining the linear distance and dimension and the locality stays as well. And this gives us like a very simple picture of what the status of QLTC is right now. So if you ask how good are the quantum locally testable codes that we know to exist, we're not at a truly optimal one yet, but the status of this conjecture is summarized in this column and in this column. So you can either have a uh, perfect dimension locality, but then soundness and distance are slightly off optimal, or you can have perfect soundness distance dimension, but then the locality is slightly off optimal. So these are the two best. Um, you might wonder, you know, we had three constructions and I've only applied two here. Um, the uh, list of useful applications of the trade-off constructions has changed over time. And the reason is that the um, progress in QLTCs has been so rapid. Um, when, we, uh, when we initially posted the work last year, there were lots and lots of applications and there were lots of things, uh, new parameter regimes discovered with them. Um, but that's changed over time. In particular, when the DLV work was posted um, in February 24, um, there, were, there was an application of weight reduction there. Um, and also those were only known conditionally. So, um, you know, some things were known conditionally and unconditionally for a while. So the situation was kind of complicated. But now the situation is much more simple as I showed on the previous slide. So I can give a, a brief overview of how these all work. Um, so the weight reduction procedure is based on um, Hastings on quantum weight reduction from 2021. And Hastings gave us weight reduction procedures for general quantum codes, but didn't analyze the change in soundness under these um, constructions, which means that you need to analyze the change in soundness to apply them to QLPCs. What makes quantum weight reduction difficult is you need to treat four things. You need to treat both qubit degrees and both check weights. So you need to deal with QX and QZ. So QX, for example, is the maximum number of um, X-type stabilizers acting on any given qubit. And then similarly, like WZ, let's say, is the maximum number of qubits involved in a Z-type stabilizer. And it's difficult. You need to get them all down to constant um, in order to make your locality constant. And that's hard to do because often a lot of the natural weight reduction procedures might reduce one of them but it might come at the expense of another of them. So Hastings gives us four constructions, so one for each. Uh, so there's copying, gauging, thickening and choosing heights and coning, and they reduce QX, WX, QZ, WZ. And the interesting thing is they have to be done in this order. Um, and the reason is, is because some of them will hurt others, but some others require others to have already been done. And in general, it's a very difficult act to sort of balance. And yeah, as I say, we analyze the change in soundness under all of these. Um, as for the soundness amplification procedure, so this is original to the paper. Uh, if I recall the definition of soundness, um, you can see that in order to increase the soundness, we're gonna have to increase the number of stabilizers violated by any error without increasing the number of total stabilizers too much. We want this fraction on the left-hand side to increase, so we need the numerator to outrun the denominator. Um, the way we do that is if we look at the stabilizers in our old code, we want to make a new code. Um, we define stabilizers in the new code as combinations of stabilizers from the old code, and the combinations that we take are according to edges of an expander graph. And um, 
the nice thing about this is the stabilizer group doesn't change because we've just changed the basis of, um, of our group. We've changed the like, list of actual stabilizer generators, but we haven't changed the stabilizer group by doing this. And this is why distance and dimension stay the same because they're properties of the stabilizer group, whereas soundness and locality are properties of your list of basis elements. Um, lastly, distance amplification. So this comes uh, from classical coding. Um, so this isn't original to the work, um, but this goes back to the work of Alan Edmonds and Luby. So it's sometimes called the AEL distance amplification procedure. Um, and it was applied to quantum coding for the first time in 2022. And then again, we analyzed the soundness under this procedure so we can apply it to quantum locally testable codes. The idea is if you have your original code then you break up your code into different blocks. And then each block you further encode into an asymptotically good QLDPC code. You then mix all of the qubits up and you mix them up again, according to the edges of an expander graph, which gives this nice pseudo random mixing. And then you further encode each block. So again, each block gets encoded, everything gets mixed, and then they, the blocks get encoded again. And the pseudo random permutation from the expander graph has the effect of uh, lifting the linear distance of those inner asymptotically good codes to the distance of the outer code. The notion is, is that in order to create an error on the new code, you have to sort of fill up every block with errors because the pseudo random permutation mixes all of the errors evenly amongst every block. Uh, that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Please do send me an email. Thanks for the great talk. Um, do you have questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a, a paper, I think last year or earlier this year from the Xanadu guys on like a, another weight reduction scheme which works by you kind of weight reduce the classical codes before you do a product rather than weight reducing the quantum code. And this gives much better uh, like constant factors relative to the hasting scheme. I guess maybe for like your kind of asymptotic stuff, you don't care about this so much, but do you have any idea uh, how that would compare to the things you do? Does this preserve soundness and things as well? Or you don't know? Um, yeah, no, this is really interesting. So um so yeah, again, so this paper was where you're reducing classical codes and then before you take the product. Of course, then that only applies to product codes. Um, and I think they only did it for the normal homological product, right? So it wasn't for like... They do lifted product. They do lifted product and balanced product. Yeah. And uh, just normal like hypergraph. Do normal hypergraph? Or... Yeah, they do normal hypergraph as well. Okay. Um, yeah, no, so that would then apply to classical codes going into like yeah, the homological product and stuff. So that is probably, I would imagine, the optimal one that you want to do for like, yeah, hypergraph product code. Um, the quantum locally testable codes that we know are very much not um, uh, product codes really at all. Um, they're, they're, I mean, the DLV work is like a, a complex. It doesn't come from a product. Um, and the other thing is that it's not clear, like if you have a classical locally testable code, you take a product, it's not clear that you can get a quantum locally testable code from that. So their scheme wouldn't apply to quantum locally testable codes. However, like, as you say, the constant factors are much better. And so if you're just interested in weight reducing a hypergraph product code, it's almost certainly just optimal to do that. Yeah. I've also got like a somewhat vague question. So this like soundness condition um, reminded me a little bit to something that people consider in the context of like self-correcting quantum memories, which is that like if you violate more and more, if you make more and more errors, your like energy barrier increases. Is this a connection you have like thought about? Um, yeah, very much so. Yeah, there's a strong connection. Um, soundness is like, you know, there's, there's like a lot of closely related properties for a quantum code to have. There's energy barrier, which you mentioned, and self-correction, and then that's kind of similar in this soundness. And there's links between all of them. There's like, some of them are formally linked. So uh, I think, for example, if you have like good 
sound is good distance, then you immediately have good energy barrier, I think. Um, but some of them are more like moral, like it just seems these are kind of similar, like um, soundness just kind of seems like single shot decoding. They just kind of, they, they seem linked. Um, uh, as for, uh, and what I would say is that soundness also does kind of seem like the strongest of them morally. Um, but like whether you can actually make a self-correcting memory out of a QLTC, um, well, it's not obvious at all, but I, yes, there definitely is a connection. Well, thanks. Um, I question? can like comment on that a bit more. So there's um, a property called confinement, which is sufficient for uh, single shot decodability. Um, and the kind of broadly like confinement and soundness are kind of, they look quite similar. But confinement, well, soundness is telling you that big errors have to have big syndromes, whereas confinement is telling you that big syndromes have to be caused by big errors. Um, and the cases that are covered by uh, soundness but not by confinement are kind of the, the cases that you miss in the, um, the like asymptotically good codes. That means they're not locally testable. Um, and I think exactly the connection between single shot decodability and soundness is not known but um definitely confinement implies single shot decodability yeah i second that yeah. right any more questions uh, uh hi thank you for the nice talk i have a small question on the ael amplification technique you use so basically you can use that to sort of get a like a qubit qrtpc code but with a very high uh, relative distance so can you comment on like how high the distance can you get to do you mean in terms of like constant factors yeah 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 um so actually you might be interested in this paper so this was the first time uh, they applied ael for quantum codes and they were looking at that they were looking at the constant factors um, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, whatever relative distance you put in, in your inner code, uh, you, you, I think you literally inherit that relative distance for the, for the broader code. So whatever you can put in there, you can get to the, uh, the bigger one. As for exact numbers, definitely look at this paper. Um, I hope I'm not about to misrepresent their paper, but if I remember correctly, what they were roughly doing was, um, taking an asymptotically good QLDPC code, so it already has linear distance, but then amplifying the actual constant of the distance using an inner code that was, I think, like quantum Reed Solomon code or something like that, um, to amplify the, the actual constant of the distance. And so they were seeing, like, can we actually push the constant all the way up to, like, the quantum singleton bound or something like that? Um, but yeah, as for the actual numbers, I would say see this paper. Okay, thank you. Uh I did see this paper and well, they have like uh, one over half uh, distance uh, close to that, but their cube at, but their alphabet is really large. So here you did like your output is a qubit code. So you also reduce the alphabet. So yeah, that's what I'm asking. Like how, how well can you do for qubit codes? Yes, sorry, yes. Um, as you say, yeah, the alphabet for this is large. And the, the reason for that is we have a slightly different um, method in this, th in this third step. We encode again into a good code. And um, what you can also do, the alternative, is in the third step, you take each block and you just call it a larger symbol, which is what they do. And as you say, that leads to a big alphabet. Um, so what could we get to? Well, we can't get, you know, using this, you inherit the relative distance of whatever you have on the inside. And because um, we have to do this encoding again to, in order to keep the alphabet binary. So yeah, the relative distance that we would get would be whatever relative distance you're putting on the inside. So the answer to your question is, yeah, just look back at any of the asymptotically good QLDPC codes, you know, Pantelev and Kalachev, DHLV, whatever you want. And that, that would be it. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? 
doesn't seem to be the case. So let's thank Adams again.